Hi, my name is Nurit Avraham from the Weizmann Institute of Science. In the following unit, we will talk about scanning, tunneling, microscopy, and spectroscopy of topological state of matter. You probably know by now that one of the hallmarks of topological state of matter is the existence of unique topological surface states on the material surfaces and boundaries, states that exhibit unique properties, and they cannot be realized as standalone system, but only when they are coupled to topological bulk. So in that sense, the use of scanning tunneling microscopy, which is a surface probe to study this material, is kind of a match made in heaven. It allows us to visualize those unique states and to characterize them both in real space and in momentum space. And I'll try to show you how this is done. So the plan is as follows. I'll start with a short introduction about the main principle of operation of STM. I'll focus on the tunneling current. And then I'll present the main type of measurements. I'll focus on quasi-particle interference measurements and their interpretation. And I will introduce different approaches to understand these measurements and to relate them to the band structure of the material. In the last part, we'll take a concrete example of a topological material, the wild semi-metal tantalum arsenide. And we will see how we use quasi-particle interference measurement to visualize the Fermi arcs, the unique topological state on the surface, and to distinguish them from trivial states that coexist on the sample surface. So let me start by fleshing out some typical STM data. Here we see a topographic image that shows the surface of the wild semi-metal tantalum arsenide down to atomic resolution. This is the arsenic termination. So every bump here represents a single arsenic atom. And we can easily see the square lattice structure that characterizes this termination. Here is another topographic image that was taken on the same surface, but just on a larger scale. So here, in addition to the square lattice that you see here behind, we can see also these impurities in the form of arsenic vacancies that disrupt the periodic structure of the crystal. This is another image that was taken exactly on the same region with exactly the same scale. However, what is shown here is the local density of state as a function of position. So we see that in the clean region, we see the signature of the crystal structure. But around these impurities, we see those elongated modulation of the density of states that are called real space quasi-particle interference patterns. And we see that they are not commensurate with the crystal structure. Now, if we take a Fourier transform of this image, we see these beautiful quasi-particle interference patterns in momentum space. And these are directly related to the surface band structure of the material. So now let's try to understand how we measure these types of images. So for now, I'll skip the wider picture of scanning tunneling microscopy, all the uh, instrumental challenges that are needed to overcome, and I'll focus only on the tunneling current, which is the main principle of operation. So in scanning tunneling microscopy, we bring an atomically sharp tip to close proximity with the sample surface. We apply a bias voltage between the tip and the sample. And we measure the tunneling current between the tip and the sample. So when we bring the tip to a distance of several angstroms, the electrons start to flow from the tip to the sample or from the sample to the tip, depending on the sign of the bias voltage. Now, this tunneling current is an extremely sensitive probe. It depends exponentially on the distance between the tip and the sample. And this what allows to measure height variation of the order of fraction of an angstrom and to image the surface of the material down to atomic resolution. As for the lateral resolution, from the same reason, the tunneling current is extremely local. It occurs from the last atom at the end of this tip. And therefore, it allows the lateral resolution that allows to measure the atomic scale resolution of the surface. OK, so now let's look a little bit more 
into this tunneling current. So here you see an illustration that represents the tunneling junction between the tip and the sample. On the left, we see the density of state of the sample as a function of energy. This is what we want to measure and to explore. In the middle, we see the vacuum barrier that represents the vacuum distance between the tip and the sample. And here, on the right, we have the density of state of the tip as a function of energy. And we see that the density of state of the tip is relatively constant as a function of energy. And this is because usually we pick uh, tip materials that the density of state is constant in the energy region of interest where we want to explore the density of state of the sample. And we will see later that this helps us to deconvolute the information about the density of state of the tip from the tunneling current and to remain only with the important information about the density of state of the tip. So the tunneling current will depend on the matrix element for tunneling, the, the probability to tunnel. And this is a property of the tunneling junction itself. It depends on the specific materials of the sample and the tip, the work functions of the different materials, the shape of the barrier, the size of the barrier. Rho S is just the density of state of the sample. Rho T is the density of state of the tip. And F of epsilon is the Fermi distribution. Now, if we apply some bias voltage between the tip and the sample, it raises the Fermi energy of the sample with respect to the Fermi energy of the tip, or vice versa if we apply a bias voltage in the other direction. And then the dominant contribution to the tunnel and current will be tunneling from the sample to the tip. Now we can simplify this expression in several ways. First, if we measure at low temperature, then the Fermi distribution cuts off sharply at the Fermi energy, and we just can replace it with some step function. And now we can divide the energy range into three dis distinct regimes. Above the Fermi energy of the sample, below the Fermi energy of the tip, and the region in between the Fermi energy of the tip and the sample. And now we can easily see that from the upper energy range above the Fermi energy of the sample, there won't be any contribution to the tunneling current since there are no states to tunnel from, not from the sample to the tip and not from the tip to the sample. All the states are empty. Similarly, for the energy range below the Fermi energy of the tip, here there won't be any contribution to the tunneling current since there are no states to tunnel into not into states in the tip and not into the sample since all the states are occupied. So the only contribution will come from the energy range in between the Fermi energy of the tip and the Fermi energy of the sample. So then we arrive to this simplified expression, which we integrate only on the energy range from 0 to the bias voltage. And now we can take another simplification. And this, we take into account the fact that the density of state of the tip is constant in the energy range where we measure. So this means that we can take the density of state of the tip out of the integral, and we arrive at this expression. And these three assumptions are the following. First, that each side, the sample and the tip, have their own independent density of state. The wave function falls sharply exponentially to 0 inside the vacuum barrier. And the overlap between the wave function is small, such that there is no mutual influence between one side on the other side of the barrier, which means that the vacuum barrier is relatively large. And then we can take the uh, matrix element out of the integral, and we arrive at this expression for the tunneling current. And as for the tunneling matrix element, we can follow the WKB approximation. And then we just assume that the uh, wave function falls exponentially to 0 inside the barrier. And we can assume that the barrier is a square barrier. And then the matrix elements will uh, 
have the following form, where s is the distance between the tip and the sample, and psi is a mixture of the work function of the tip and the sample. So now let's see how we use this tunneling current to measure all the, these images that we saw at the beginning. So let's start with topographic measurement. So this is the expression for the tunneling current with its exponential dependence on the distance between the tip and the sample. So we bring the tip to the sample and we measure the tunneling current while applying some bias voltage. And now we raster the tip across the sample while keeping the tunneling current constant. Keeping the tunneling current constant is done by a electronic feedback loop that reads the value of the current, compares it with some preset value, and calculates the response and sends it back to uh, control the height of the tip. Now, we see that when the tip is above a single atom, the distance is smaller, and when the tip is in between atoms, the, the distance is larger. So in order to keep the tunneling current constant, the tip has to go up and down, the tip has to move up and down, and therefore it follows the curvature of the surface of the material down to the atomic resolution. Okay, it is not exactly defined what we mean when we say that we measure the height of the sample since the tunneling current depends both on the distance between the tip and the sample and also on the tunneling density of state. So what we actually measure is contour of constant charge density that relates to the topography of the material and uh, image its atomic resolution. And here we see the example that we saw at the beginning of tantalum arsenide surface down to its atomic resolution. Here is another example of bismutelluride iodine, another topological material, a dual topological insulator with a different crystal structure. And here we see the surface of silicon with its 7 on 7 reconstruction that was first observed by scanning tunneling microscopy after its first uh, development. Here is another example of the surface of gold 111. Here we see atomic steppages and the herring bond, which is the characteristic reconst reconstruction of gold 111. Another type of measurement that I like to discuss is measurement of the local density of state. So here we see again the expression for the tunneling current. Now, if we will measure not the tunneling current, but rather the derivative of the current with respect to the bias voltage, we can see that we measure something which is proportional to the local density of state of the sample. If we will just take a derivative of this expression with respect to the bias voltage, then we see that it's proportional to the local density of state of the uh, sample. Now there are different types of the IDV measurement that we can take. So this is a topography of bismutelluride iodine the dual topological insulator. It's a layered material, so every terrace here represents different termination. Now we can take point spectrum. Here we just locate the tip on a certain position on the surface, and we measure the density of state as a function of energy just by changing the bias voltage between the tip and the sample. We can also take line cuts, and here we measure such curves but we see how they change as we uh, move specially across the sample along this line cut. So here is the DIDV as a function of energy, and we see how it changes as we move from termination to termination. And we can also see if there is something interesting close to the edges of these terraces. We can also take the IDV map. And here we measure the density of state as a function of position at a certain bias voltage. This specific image was taken at minus 100 MeV, and it was taken close to the edge of this terrace. So let's look a little bit on this image, and we can see that it actually visualizes a topological one-dimensional channel that is bound to the edge of this terrace. The low 
Density of state is represented by blue, red is high density of state, and we, and we can see here an increase of the density of state close to the edge of the sample due to the existence of one dimensional topological channel at the edge of this terrace. So the last type of measurement that I like to introduce is quasi-particle interference measurements. Both the topographic measurements and the DIDV measurements that we discussed before give information about real space. Now, if you want to extract momentum space information, uh, we can perform quasi-particle interference measurements. So here we see the topography of copper 111. Similar to other noble metals such as gold and silver, it is characterized by a surface state in the form of two-dimensional nearly free electron gas. So here we see the point spectrum of the surface state. These states below this line corresponds to bulk state, but here this bump that onsets at minus 450 MeV corresponds to the surface states uh, on the surface of copper. And this is the parabolic uh, um, dispersion as expected for free electron gas. Now, if we want to extract information about this momentum dispersion, we can do quasi-particle interference. And then we just take the IDV map, but around impurities or near steppages and not in clean regions. These defects serve as scattering sources for the surface electron such that the incoming electron is scattered back and interfere with the outgoing electron and this gives rise to this beautiful modulation in the density of state that look very much like those paddles that we see when we drop a stone into the water. Now we can characterize the modulation and we will see that the dominant frequency of the modulation will correspond to the distance between the two branches of the momentum dispersion, the distance between the incoming and the outgoing wave vector in momentum space at exactly the same energy that the measurement was taken. So if we will go and take the same map at a lower energy, then the frequency will be smaller as expected from the difference between the incoming and the scattered wave vector. This means that if we follow the frequency of this modulation as a function of energy, we can reconstruct the dispersion of these surface states on the copper surface. So let's do this. So here we have a line cut across this modulation. And let's see the density of state and the weight changes as a function of energy. So here is the DIDV as a function of energy measured along this line cut. So we can see that at high energy, the modulations are uh, more frequent. And we see that at low energy, we have lower frequency modulation. And if we take a Fourier transform, we see immediately the parabolic dispersion that represents the parabolic dispersion of the nearly free electron gas on the surface. Now we just need to remember that here in the momentum transfer space, the distance is twice the distance uh, that we have in the uh, momentum space since scattering can occur to both directions. So now let's see how we use this quasi-particle interference measurement to study the topological surface states that are called Fermi arc on the surface of the wild semi-metal tantalum arsenide. So here again, we see the topography of tantalum arsenide, the arsenic termination that we saw at the beginning of the unit. Here is the DIDV that was taken exactly on the same region. We see those real space quasi-particle interference pattern around the arsenic vacancy. And now, if we take a Fourier transform, we see these beautiful quasi-particle interference patterns in momentum space. And now we would like to relate this momentum space quasi-particle interference to different scattering processes and to different states in the material surface band structure. So the first approach that I like to introduce in order to understand these quasi-particle interference images is the joint density of state approach. 
which correspond to a simple model of quadriparticle interference in which every wave vector in this quadriparticle interference image connects regions of high density of state in a contour of constant energy cut of the brilliant zone. So here we see such a CCE cut, which was taken exactly at the same energy where this measurement was taken. In the specific example, this is the Fermi energy. So here we have a cut of the brilliant zone at the Fermi energy. Now the joint density of state is just all the scattering possibility between different states in this CCE cut. So let's take, for example, this ellipse band that we see around here. So all the scattering processes inside this ellipse band will give rise to this ellipse shape QPI in the joint density of state. All the scattering between these uh, states in this bowtie shape uh, band will give rise to this bowtie shape QPI, and scattering, for example, between the bowtie shape and the ellipse band will give rise to this uh, uh, four green square at the corners of this image. Now, what we see here is not exactly the joint density of state, but rather the spin selective scattering probability, which is just the joint density of state plus the information about the spin direction. It is the joint density of state weighted by the relative direction of the spins of the scattered state. So now let's go back to the data and let's compare this spin selective scattering probability with the measured data. Let's try to compare this with the central square in the middle of the image. So we see that this ellipse band QPI is shown around here in the center. Also this bowtie shape yellow uh, QPI can be seen around here in the center. Here it's a little bit faint, but we see a more intensity uh, pattern of it at the other Bragg peaks. And this green square at the four corners of the square, we can find them around here in the corners of the uh, square uh, in the middle of the image. Now, what we've seen so far are scattering processes between trivial state. Now, we should remember that we wanted to identify the topological state signature. So here are the topological Fermi arc. So every scattering process that will involve these states will give a signature of the topological states on the surface of the material. Now, if we calculate all the scattering processes between this arc and the uh, trivial tail that is around here, we will get to this uh, red QPI, and we can see that this QPI is peaking behind this ellipse. Now, if we zoom in and put side by side the calculation and the measured data, data we see a perfect agreement between the calculation and the measured data, and which means that this QPI is visualization of the topological Fermi arcs in momentum space. We need to remember that the joint density of state is only an approximation which is closely related to the quasi-particle interference image. One of the effects, for example, that it misses is interference effect which can uh, dramatically change the quasi-particle interference structure. Another approach that does take interference into account is the Green's function approach. Here the QPI, which is what we measure, is represented by rho as a function of Q and omega, where S is just the integral over the Green function at K and omega, which represents the wave function that propagates from the tip to the impurity, times the impurity potential, which is Q dependent, times the Green function at K plus Q, which represents the wave function that scatters back from the impurity back to the tip. Now, this is similar to the JDOS approach in the sense that everything is in the same energy, which means that scattering occurs between states of the same energy. Also, here we have something at K, 
times something at k plus q. In the JDOS approach, it was the density of state. Here is the, J the green function. It differs from the JDOS approach in the sense that here we also include v of q, the impurity potential, which is q dependent. In the JDOS approach, we assume that the scattering is isotropic, independent of q. And here we have impurity potential, which is q dependent. And the last thing is that this is a complex, so it can also have a phase. And in the JDOS approach, everything was completely real. The last thing I'd like to introduce is the perturbation theory point of view to the Green's function approach, which was developed by Adi Stern and myself and gives a more intuitive understanding to the Green's function approach. So here we start with the local density of state as a function of position and energy, which is just what we measure when we take the IDV map as a function of position at a certain bias voltage. Now we want to ask how this is affected when we introduce an impurity at R0. So when we do this, we get a modified wave function, which is just the uh, original eigenstate plus some correction from first order perturbation theory, which is linear in V, and it has the expected energy denominator times the wave function that the impurity mixes into the eigenstate. So now, in order to calculate the local density of state, we need to calculate psi uh, absolute squared. And then we find that the interference term in uh, psi absolute squared is the following term, which is linear in V. And now let's take a concrete example where the impurity potential has the following form. It's just V naught time a delta function. And then in momentum space, it will be just V naught. And now, now let's plug it all into the expression of the density of state. And then we find that the interference term in the tunneling density of state will be the following sum. And the last step, step that we need to do is to take a Fourier transform exactly as we do to our uh, measurement, to the, uh, the IDV measurement in real space. So when we take the Fourier transform, we arrive to this expression of the QPI as a function of Q and energy, which is given by the following expression. Now, if we look on this expression, we see that this is exactly the same expression that we got in the Green's function approach. I'm not going to do it, but if we will write this in terms of Green's function, we will get exactly the same expression. This means that the physics behind the Green's function approach just expresses the first order effect of the impurity on the wave function. And this is reflected in the local density of state, which we measure and we relate to the surface band structure of the material. Now, this brings me to the end of the theoretical part of this unit. So now, before I invite you to a lab tour to see what more is needed in order to operate an STM, let me summarize what we had in this unit. So we talked about the main principle of operation of scanning tunneling microscope, the tunneling current. We talked about different types of measurement, topographic measurement, the IDV measurement, and quasi-particle interference measurement. We saw different approaches to understand quasi-particle interference measurement and to relate them to the band structure of the material. And we saw also a concrete example of the topological material while semi-metal tantalum arsenide. And we saw how we use quasi-particle interference measurement to visualize the unique topological surface states, the Fermi arc, on the surface of the material and to distinguish them from the tri trivial state that coexists on the sample surface. And now, let me invite you to a lab tour in our STM lab. We are now at our STM lab, located at the ground floor of the physics faculty building, in order to avoid coupling to the vibrations of the whole building. In the lab, we have three systems that have different functionalities and cover different regimes of temperature, energy resolution, and magnetic fields. So let's enter one of the acoustic rooms and see what more is needed in order to operate an STM machine.
Now we are inside the acoustic room where the STM machine is actually located. This room is surrounded by concrete walls. At the end, the mass of the concrete provides the best isolation against acoustic noises. And also on top of them, we have these acoustic cassettes that prevent standing waves from building up inside the room. Inside the room, we have the concrete pit, which is separated from the floor of the building and sitting on its own foundations in the ground. On top of the pit, we have the optical table, which gives us another level of isolation. And then eventually, in most of the STM machines, the microscope is suspended on springs and has a magnetic eddy current uh, uh, vibration isolation mechanism. Because of the spectacular special resolution of STM, we must maintain the surfaces perfectly clean. For that, we need to operate under ultra-high vacuum UHV conditions. To achieve this, we must take some steps. First of all, all of the connections of the systems are UHV compatible. Then, we bake the system, but baking just brings us to high vacuum, between 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 7 torr uh, pressure. In order to go below to UHV condition, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, we must also bake the system. We do it with heater tapes and we cover the whole system with this aluminum foil that maintains the heat inside and we practically bake the system. What this does is releases all the gases that are trapped on the inner walls, including moisture, and then we get to ultra-high vacuum conditions. Lastly, during operation, we cannot pump with mechanical uh, moving uh, parts, which is why we use ion pumps that pump without any mechanical vibration. By this, we maintain ultra-high vacuum conditions. In order to obtain the high en energy resolution that we need, and also to have access to the interesting physics that happens at low temperatures, we must maintain our microscope within a cryogenic environment. We can do it in different ways. In this machine, the microscope is sitting inside, inside the cryostat, which is located down in the barrel under the optical table, and this is a helium-3 uh, cryostat. In the other rooms, we have a variable temperature STM, which is based on a continuous flow cryostat, and also a dilution fridge-based uh, STM that reaches even lower temperatures, down to 30 millikelvin. So you see that the system is quite big. However, the STM head, where the tip and the sample are located and where the scanning actually occurs, is relatively small. It's about 3 cm in diameter and about 5 to 6 cm height. And it is located in a cryogenic space of the microscope, here below the opt optical table, inside the helium dewar. In one hand, the STM head has to be rigid enough in order to prevent vibrational coupling to change the tip sample separation. On the other hand, it has to have all motion degrees of freedom to allow to bring the tip to the sample to within tunneling range without crashing onto the sample and to allow scanning throughout the sample while keeping the tip sample separation constant to within fraction of an angstrom throughout the whole measurement. Now, bringing the tip to the sample and the coarse movement is controlled by a coarse positioning unit, whereas the fine movement is controlled by, is controlled by a scanner tube. Both mechanisms are based on piezoelectric materials that have the property that they change their deformation as a response to electrical electric field and convert electrical energy into mechanical motion. Finally, the tip sample separation is controlled by a digital feedback loop that takes the current value and compares it to some preset value and calculate the response according to some user-defined feedback parameters and sends the feedback back to the piezoelectric controller to change the motion of the tip. Electronically, the tunneling currents are within picoampere to nanoampere, so in order to avoid artifacts in the tunneling spectra due to noise contamination, all the electronics should be well shielded, ground loops should be avoided, and crosstalks between the various signals should be uh, minimized as much as possible. So now that you are familiar with all the STM parts, let's join Dror 
in the wet room and follow all the stages that the sample goes through since its initial positioning on the sample holder until it is ready to be approached by the STM tip. We pick a flat piece of crystal and glue it onto a copper shim to be positioned on the sample holder. In parallel, we clean all the sample holder parts by ultrasonic cleaning to be compatible with ultra-high vacuum conditions. We then screw in the sample plate to the clean holder We pick the combined sample holder with the transfer rod and take it to the STM room We put the sample into the system through the load lock We then close the load lock and pump it. At this stage, we either cleave the sample to expose a freshly clean surface or prepare the sample in the designated chamber by sputtering and annealing cycles. We then use magnetically coupled manipulators to transfer the sample between the ultra-high vacuum chambers into the cryogenic space of the microscope. Now, the sample is ready to be approached by the STM tip and measured. We leave the STM room and control the measurement externally from the control room.